and thanks uh, everybody for for coming along to my presentation on low velocity profiling. Uh, what I'm going to do over the next sort of 15 to 20 minutes is um, take you through a potential problem with current prescriptive methods as they stand as I see it, um, introduce this idea of low velocity profiling, um, discuss some of the considerations based on the current research that's out there at the moment and that, that includes my own um, and highlight some practical recommendations as this presentation is sort of aimed at strength and conditioning coaches and, and, and those in the applied setting. Uh, but before I do that, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the process that an SSC coach might typically go through um, in order to prescribe load. So that will normally that will start off with a, a pre-intervention testing session that might include a one RM or a one repetition maximum strength assessment. And that strength assessment is basically an inter incremental protocol that culminates in finding an individual's uh, maximal load they can lift for one repetition in a given exercise. And following that, that baseline test, um, we will, the, the, the coach would then prescribe a, a training block or a training intervention that would, could be anywhere from sort of four to, to, to maybe 12 weeks. And that would have a focus based maybe around a, a physiological adaptation or a physical quality. And within that block, um, load would typically be prescribed as a percentage of that initial strength assessment. So 85% one RM, for example. Following the intervention, um, post-testing will take place, exactly the same uh, testing uh, method, and then numbers would be readjusted based on a, an improvement in strength, hopefully, and that cycle, cycle would then continue. So if I put that into a bit of an example for, for everybody, um, and let's say we have an athlete uh, that has a, a current back squat 1RM of 150 kilograms. And over the, the, the course of a six week intervention, they increase their strength levels by 10%. What we know definitely doesn't happen is their strength levels stay exactly the same for the full six weeks. And then on that final testing session, we get a sudden increase in strength and we get that 10% improvement. What we think probably does happen uh, is just this gradual increase in strength across the course of the intervention. But if we put, provide a little bit more context to that, and if we put that into kind of a weekly prescription, um, and let's say we want to provide our, our individual, or our, our athlete with a target intensity of 85% 1RM, and the equivalent um, absolute load, so kilograms on the bar, would therefore equate to 127.5 kilograms. For the first two weeks, that 127.5 kilograms might be bang on the stimulus that we want to elicit the adaptation that we require from that target intensity. However, as our athlete, based on that model I just presented, starts to improve their strength, what we might find is that 127.5 kilograms no longer matches up to that target intensity. And all this is based on the, the perfect example of um, an individual getting stronger with no real confounding variables to, to, to take into account. So if we then put this example into, let's say, a team sport, like a rugby athlete, and we take the same 1RM strength levels, but we now start to introduce some confounding variables such as sleep, such as technical and tactical training or competition or fixture congestion, nutrition and resistance training, and travel, what we might find happen to those strength levels across the course of that intervention might look something a bit more like this. And if we put that, I'm sorry, there's, there's, there is research out there, um, albeit a little bit tentative, that shows that there is maybe upwards of a 20% uh, fluctuation in 1RM across the course of intervention from week to week. So if we put that back into our example and um, what we might find is it could look something like this. And as you can see there, we never at any point actually hit that 85% training intensity target based on those kind of confounding variables. Okay, granted in some weeks we're not far off, but in other weeks we're, we're quite a way away. So that then begs the question, how do we circumnavigate these issues? And yes, there are methods available such as subjective scales like RPE um, or predictive equations that could help bridge that gap. But I think actually this is where load velocity profiling comes into play and is potentially the better option. 
So the low velocity profile is based on the low velocity relationship, which is pretty much, pretty much analogous to the force velocity curve, which suggests that as the load or the force requirements of active muscle increases, the velocity of that active muscle uh, of that of that muscle shortening must decrease and therefore we have an inverse relationship between load or force and velocity and the main reason for this is is likely to be cross bridge cycling which is the the underpinning physiological mechanism to how human muscle produces force and essentially how this fits into the force velocity curve is that as the, the velocity of shortening increases, the time at which um, the two contractile proteins, actin and myosin, have to bind to one another reduces and therefore reduces the amount of force that can be developed. And it's because of these strong relationships that it's allowed researchers like myself and, and other people in the field look at the, the practicalities of this method and, and how it fits into an, an applied setting. So what is the load velocity profile? Well, it's basically an incremental strength assessment and it's, it's very, very similar to a 1RM. And the only real difference is that during the profile, velocity is recorded throughout each repetition. And that velocity is likely to be mean or peak velocity. Uh, so what we mean by mean is the average velocity across the concentric phase of a lift and peak velocity we're referring to an instantaneous maximum that occurs during that concentric portion of, a, of an exercise. And once we've, plot, once we've collected all the data, we, we plot the loads, um, either absolute or relative versus velocity. We apply a mathematical model, typically linear or nonlinear regression to the data. That gives an, us an R squared value and a predictive equation. And this is what a, a profile might look like. So on the right hand side, you have uh, our athlete who's going through an incremental back squat protocol. Uh, in the center, you've got a linear positions transducer, which is measuring the mean velocity of the, of the back squat, which is the up phase. And then obviously on the left hand side, you have our figure that's plotting mean velocity against percentage one RM load. And this athlete went through a, an eight point protocol starting at 30% one RM and ending up at 100% 1RM, so full true maximal uh, 1RM, um, which for this particular athlete was at 180 kilograms. Um, for this profile, we only looked at mean velocity because uh, research and certainly um, my experience with it shows that the mean velocity just has a slightly better reliability and, and matches to this kind of exercise a little bit better. For the lighter loads, we typically do maybe three to five repetitions. Moderate loads, we do maybe two. And then obviously for the heavier loads, because of the weight, we would only, uh, we would only do single repetitions. Once we've collected all the data, as I've already mentioned, we can then plot the lines and get the predictive equations. I've actually done both here. So we've got the, the linear regression at the top and then the nonlinear second order polynomial at the bottom. Um, and we have the two equations, which essentially we can take and we can use in, in many different ways, um, most of which are, are sort of past the scope of this, this particular presentation. So if we then put that, exam, that, that idea, that concept back into our example, and just to remind you, we have our athlete of, with a target training intensity of 85%, and we have this issue of not quite matching up to that 85% throughout the course of the intervention. But if we then start to, to implement low velocity profiling, and what we have here is an example of maybe 10 or 12 participants or, or, or individuals, all plotted on the same uh, figure with increments of 5% starting at 30 and ending up at 100% 1RM. And in, in, this, uh, in this instance, there was a, we, we found the mean um, velocity across the group, and we also produced a, produced a band. And the reason for that is because if you think about the units that we're dealing with, we're working in 0 0.01 of a meter per second. And in order to get someone to hit that on a regular basis with, with no error either side is very, very difficult. And obviously technology that we use has measurement error and so does human movement. So a, a band is, is, is a good idea or a zone to work in. And for this particular group, we have a target velocity of 0 0.51 meters per second which equates to that 85% 1RM. So we put that back into our example and 
instead of providing a target of 127.5 kilograms, we simply provide the target velocity of 0.51 meters per second, plus or minus x, x meters per second. And what this does is it allows our coach, or our athlete, to then manipulate the load on the bar and essentially match up as close as we can to that 0.51 meters per second. So if in this instance, we're getting stronger, then that 127.5 kilograms might go up to 130, 132.5, uh, for example. And what we, hope this ha what we hope happens is that this allows us to top up those uh, intensities and those loads and match us in a, in a much closer um, way to that 85% target intensity. So at the moment, everything's sounding great and, it's a, and we're kind of, we're, we've got a really good um, approach or methodology that we can implement. But obviously with most, like most things, we have some considerations that we need to take into account. And these considerations come from the research. And the first one is to, to, to really determine whether that profile is actually individual or not. So obviously in the previous example, I've, I've shown you that um, the, the, the profile itself was mapped on 10 or 12 different individuals. And actually some of the earlier research, this was the aim that we could take normative data from the literature, we could take um, predictive equations and we could implement them in, in many different applied settings and still get the same results. And this even led to us uh, technology companies uh, primarily coming up with these zones or these bands that we could work in, um, in any applied setting. So I actually wouldn't even need to do the profile yourself you could just take this, this normative data, implement it into your practice, and you're creating the right kind of stimulus. Unfortunately, that wasn't necessarily the case. And this is some research from my PhD. Um, and what we did was we took 10 um, competitive weightlifters, all with very similar strength levels. So we had a pretty homogenous group. We got them all to perform a full load velocity profile uh, in the free weight back squat, and we plotted the data against one another. And as you can see here, this figure, um, the, the top one is mean velocity and the bottom is peak velocity. And we've found that as the loads got heavier, the between participant variability, so the variation between participants was upwards of 30% coefficient variation. So what that basically means is if we take that example of our 0.51 meters per second, that for one person in that group, it may, may well be 85% 1RM, but for somebody else that, that 0.51 meters per second might actually be 75% 1RM. And therefore we're promoting and, and eliciting completely different physiological adaptations in the same group of people that we probably want to be eliciting the same uh, adaptation. So I would always recommend where possible, do a, a, an individualized low velocity profile. And the second consideration uh, based on the literature was, uh, and again, this was one of the original aims, I think, from, from, from load velocity profiling, was whether we could predict 1RM. So whether we could bring an athlete into a, a session, take two or three submaximal loads, get that predictive equation, predict what 1RM would be, and then readjust the numbers for that, that session that they're just about to take. So readjust the loads that correspond to the, the relative intensities. But again, unfortunately, it wasn't quite the case. So here's the, there's, a, there's a load of research out on this at the moment. Here's just three examples. And as you can see in all of them, we get quite a big difference between the actual measured 1RM and the different predictive models going up to different um, percentages of 1RM. Some in some instances up to upwards of 30%, uh, sorry, 30 kilograms. And potentially one of the reasons for this is due to the reliability of, of some of the heavier loads. So again, this is, is research from, um, from my PhD and taking that same cohort, those 10 um, competitive weightlifters, we got them to not only profile once, but profile three times across three, sub, uh, three different days, all doing the exact same protocol. And what we found was as the loads got heavier, the reliability of that data uh, reduced. So we've got coefficient variation and uh, typical error here that increase quite a lot as we get up to those heavier loads. Um, so potentially including those in a profile actually might be, um, might be a disadvantage and, and may affect the reliability of that data. And as with any, um, any kind of methodology like this, 
we've got practical recommendations that we need to take into account. Uh, the first one being that the profile itself is shown to be very exercise specific. So for example, if I was to undertake a profile in a back squat, I couldn't take that data and transfer it across into a different exercise such as deadlift, bench press, even a front squat that is very, is very similar biomechanically, um, they still have completely different profiles. Um, determining the appropriate number of loads is, is really important and it's kind of a trade-off between practicality and robustness and reliability of the data and of the equation of, and of, the, of the line that you plot. Um, so for me, the, the more data points, the better, but that obviously then has its knock-on effect to how easy that is to apply um, within the sort of the strength and conditioning setting. The type of technology employed can affect the data, so it doesn't necessarily have to, you don't necessarily have to choose the best, um, the most valid and most reliable piece of equipment, although I would always recommend you do if you can, but sometimes um, budgets don't necessarily stretch that far. But what is important is that the technology isn't interchangeable, so you must keep the same piece of technology throughout the, the time that you're collecting this kind of data. And I think this is probably the most important recommendation that, and is, is something that's very alien to a lot of people that even experience lifters, is the fact that we need each repetition to be performed with maximal intensity and as fast as possible. So when you're squatting a, a kind of a 30% load that you would normally just go through the motions with, to do that maximally is, is quite strange for a lot of people. So I think habituation and some familiarization in, this kind of, in that kind of um, approach is, is definitely needed. And then finally, uh, the, the training history and lifting experience is definitely important just for competency of lift and consistency of lifts to make sure that the reliability isn't, uh, isn't not reliable, uh, sorry, that the data isn't not reliable because of the competency of the lifter. Um, and again, like most methodologies, there are, it does have its limitations. And, and I think the fact that the, the profile is individualized um, is actually a limitation because it, it's very time consuming and it's, it's actually quite difficult, certainly if you're in a team setting to, to, um, to apply and maybe even is, is a little bit more complicated than the current methods that we have. So again, it's that trade off between what you can achieve in the time that you have. The fact that the reliability at heavier loads is poor is, is a limitation and can limit um, sort, of, sort of going past that 90% 1RM at, at using this method and maybe we should only be implementing profiles from sort of light loads such as 20-30% and up to 90%. The best technology can often be expensive so again like I've mentioned budgets don't always stretch that far and actually it is a bit of a technological minefield out there so there's probably 50 plus um, devices on the market all doing pretty much the exact same thing so to try and figure that out which is the most appropriate for, for, for your applied setting is it can be quite difficult. Finally then, just to, to kind of go over some future directions, for, for me personally, it's to, to come to the end of the PhD and, and um, unfortunately study four was uh, rudely interrupted by COVID-19. Um, so I need to go back and complete that data collection, but essentially I'm, 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 hope, I'm looking to update the, the approach that I've just gone through and, and see if we can also map some um, sort of physical characteristics or qualities to the profile that might be might be usable in um, certain training blocks and then ideally I'll look at the efficacy of a velocity based training intervention versus the traditional methods but alongside that we still need to find out a hell of a lot more about this 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 approach we need to determine reasoning for for the poor reliability at heavy loads we need to improve the methods of, of prediction uh, so one RM prediction we need to investigate the stability of the profile following training interventions. So if we implement a profile and our athlete gets stronger over six weeks, do the velocities actually stay the same at those relative intensities or do they change as well? And if so, that has a knock on effect to the kind of the usability and the efficacy of this, this method. Um, determines some more practical and, and, and efficient methods that maintain the, the robustness of, of doing quite a few different data points within a profile. And then finally, to assess the impact and, and, and the reliability in other populations. So this is very much geared towards athletes at the moment, but there's no reason why this can't span um, into kind of youth, uh, older adults and, and other demographics as well.
that's me. Thanks very much. Okay, great job, Steve. Thanks very much. Um, if you'd like to stop this, there we are. Um, so, does anyone have any questions for Steve? Okay, I will ask questions again. Um, obviously, Steve, you know this isn't my area, so apologies. Yep. <laughs> these are ludicrous curveballs. Um, you mentioned it quite a lot. I was pleased that you mentioned it quite a lot around the reliability of the one RM or the uh, unreliability of the one RM. So, can you ever be confident in the stats uh, the, that, that you're running if the comparator is is unreliable and unstable? Sorry, I, I might have slightly misunderstood me. So the, the 1RM test itself, so when you do an incremental protocol just using load, um, that's extremely reliable. That's, that's very, very reliable. It's the, it's the velocities at those heavy loads that become unreliable. Um, so it's, it's whether you would implement a profile above sort of 90% 1RM um, and whether you would measure velocity up at that those heavy loads whether that's the the best option given the the reliability of that that data but i think on that the other thing to think about is that generally the the the, the numbers that we're dealing with at one rm so in terms of velocity could be around 0.2 meters per second so if you even have a fluctuation of 0.02 meters per second that's already 10 percent difference and I think that maybe the, the, the scale of measure is actually inflating those CVs a little bit. And I think that's something that, that probably needs to be looked into a little bit more. Um, on that point, maybe from a slightly more practical perspective, if you ask me to move at uh, 0.51 meters per second, I don't quite know how fast I'd move. Um, how, how easy is it for us to regulate our, our speed, our velocity? So that, that's, yeah, so that's basically why every every rep needs to be done maximally so if if we can't if our athletes or or whoever we're working with can't do that so can't um move from the bottom of a squat up to the top as fast as they possibly can with consistency then this does fall down a little bit but as soon as you get someone with the competency and the ability to do that and it does only takes a few kind of habituation sessions really to, to figure out how it how it works um then that kind of issue does does go away quite a lot and and actually when again when you get up to those heavy loads you're not really thinking about moving it as fast as possible you're just thinking about moving it because you'll naturally have to do it as fast as possible anyway given the the load that you're trying to move okay oh Leighton, i have a question if that's all right please tom oh <laughs> uh steve uh, really interesting presentation i, I think you put it into context really well why this is uh, important uh, in terms of a training program. Um, I just uh, want to get your thoughts on actually using it for, for kind of athlete monitoring on a day by day basis and, and kind of physical readiness to uh, train and kind of what's your experience in kind of using that and from the literature. Um, yeah, so literature, there's not an awful lot. The, the, the only paper that, that I'm really aware of did do that they did a, a, a sort of a, a, a protocol to failure and then looked at the the, the one rm the, sorry the, the profile but they actually predicted one rm and we've, we've I've kind of shown that that's not a good idea so that kind of fell down a little bit from my own experiences um i think velocity is would be and and, and is quite sensitive to fatigue um and it's something that i, I do hopefully plan on doing at some point it's not necessarily going to fit part of my phd but 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 on the you know away from that i would like to look into that a little bit in a little bit more detail because i think even if you're not profiling somebody you could still um set some very simple targets you could still set a petite just pick one load measure the velocity do whatever um kind of fatiguing protocol and then measure the velocity again and see how that changes and if there is sensitivity there, which I think there is, then there's no reason why as an athlete enters a gym, they can simply stick a bar on the back, attach whatever device it is they're using, do a few um, exercises, whatever the, the desired one is, and figure out how close they are to being sort of ready, ready to train. Yeah, I, I think that would be re really interesting, especially that velocity loss over a set. Yeah. Um, or over repeated sets as well in terms of training load management. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, I agree. All right. Thanks, Steve. Cool. 
Apologies. On that note, for future collaboration, uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call it a day. Um, so thank you for, for taking the time and uh, hopefully we'll see you all again in two weeks' time for the next one. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you.